Hello, and welcome to day two of the 2021 CERT Insider Risk Management Symposium, the Carnegie Mellon University Software Engineering Institute's eighth annual conference on insider threats and insider risk management. We'd like to thank our sponsors for this event, Code42, Sideris, and Forcepoint for their support. This is day two of our eighth annual event this year. The recording from day one's activities can be found on the SEI's YouTube channel. What you'll find waiting for you in that video asset is a presentation on what's new from the SEI over the past year and in insider risk, as well as a panel on trends and technical approaches to insider risk quantification. We certainly wanna thank everyone who participated in day one for coming back to visit with us on day two and encourage anybody who might've missed day one's activities and presentations to check out that video on the SEI's YouTube channel. Today, we're pleased to be joined with a couple of different activities. A presentation on applying risk management strategies to insider threat use cases, as well as a panel on balanced approaches to insider risk management. And throughout our presentation and our panels today, we'd certainly encourage you to ask questions to the presenters and panelists throughout using the comments and chat feature functionality within the YouTube platform itself. With that, I'd like to get things underway with our first event, a presentation titled The Unspoken Threat, Ransomware Infections Via the Insider Threat Factor. Pleased to welcome back to this year's symposium, Randy Trezak, Principal Researcher and Technical Director in the CERT Division of the Software Engineering Institute, as well as welcome Brett Tucker, our Cyber Risk Management Technical Manager here within the SEI. Randy, take it away. Thank you very much. Uh, it's great to be here again, uh, returning on day two. Uh, it's a pleasure to be working here with Brett Tucker as we try to merge the two topics of risk and risk mitigation as we try to address insider threats within that context. So Brett, it's great to be here talking with you today. Looking forward to some great discussion. And as Dan did say, we do I encourage everyone to submit any questions or comments through the chat feature uh, as well. So looking forward to it. So Brett, back over to you, please. Yeah, thank you uh, both Randy and Dan for having me in uh, for this uh, great event. It's been exciting and I really want to uh, uh, speak out to everybody on the theme that you've been seeing and it's recurring from the previous day. Go ahead, Randy, go back to that last slide there. Yep. Yeah, perfect. And uh, the, the good thing about uh, this event is that it's really keeping you in the mindset of connecting that insider risk program, those insider risks, with that global enterprise portfolio. So we're going to build on that today and speak to how this is truly a team sport, where you should be reaching across an organization broadly to manage these risks in a, a more integrated fashion. And the cool thing about this particular presentation is we're going to talk specifically about a case study or use case with ransomware. And uh, we're going to give you some bits and pieces and some details as to how that would play out in an insider threat perspective. But I also want to like, you know, point it back to the idea of how it would look in an enterprise risk portfolio and maybe even give you some basic tools that you can use to enhance that. So as we go to the next slide, I just want to set the stage for you here. The idea is that we recognize that we're not going to escape this problem. Uh, neither ransomware nor insider risk, right? So uh, we do know that these risks in concert make for a far more complex risk environment to navigate. And you find that a lot of organizations are struggling just to survive. So if you don't get your organization aligned and everybody aware of what risks are out there, you're going to struggle. So uh, the fact that you're even watching this is showing that there's just, just general awareness and a concern, which a plus for that, but now to go to that next step. And we need to get you all to evolve to that next step of understanding how enterprise risk and insider risk, uh, they, they streamline together and you can get uh, some big savings in terms of how you're gonna manage your risk portfolio and how you're actually gonna reduce your risk exposure at the same time. It's gonna take a little agility on your part, but I think it's absolutely there. So before we dive in, I'm gonna turn back over to Randy real quick and he's gonna advance the next slides and show you a little bit about the insider threat piece and we're gonna start knitting these pieces together. So go ahead, Randy, let me know what you got on the insider risk side. That sounds good, thanks, Brett. So if we put this in the context of general information security risk management, you're probably well aware of, of a traditional formula of how that's calculated. You know, looking at risk as the probability that a threat 
will exploit a vulnerability causing or resulting in some unwanted outcome that's realized on the part of the organization. But if we dissect, dissect that in just a little bit more detail, looking at the threat specifically, you know, threats can be internal, they can be external. Uh, those threats can be human or non-human. Uh, they can be malicious or non-malicious. So when we look to build the component that describes the threat to the organization, we certainly wanna recognize holistically that it's both external and internal threats the human and non-human, as well as malicious and non-malicious. So when you look to build an effective enterprise risk management strategy, failure to address the internal threat will not give you a true perspective of the true risk to your information security assets, as well as your physical assets within your organization. So we certainly want this to be holistic in nature, looking for ways that you can build this and integrate this into your enterprise-wide risk assessment processes within your organization. So with that being said, as we look to build insider threat mitigation in the context of risk management, we wanna start which is traditionally on the left side of this particular chart, which are the incidents that you're trying to prevent and or detect. And this will go hand in hand with what Brett will describe as far as asset identification. Starting with, well, what are the assets you're trying to protect? What are the potential incidents that could impact those critical assets to you as an organization? And then what we're trying to do is put prevention strategies at the asset level, detection strategies at the asset level. And at that point, we may have a chance at addressing internal and external threats with similar strategies. Maybe that's a tool or a tool set or a process or a process set. So really focusing on the incidents that you're trying to prevent as the first goal of risk management, looking at ways by which we're gonna do that from a critical asset identification perspective. And then if we are able to prevent, that's great. But if we're able to detect as early as possible, really to minimize the impact to the organization. And then if we're able to detect, have a consistent way by which we respond and recover from that particular incident. Now then that as we walk back from there, we want to be able to identify from an insider threat perspective, what are the insider threats to those particular critical assets that were identified? You know, the insider threats potentially have access or actually will have access to those critical assets and they potentially could be motivated with malicious intent to cause harm or in some cases accidentally or non-maliciously may cause harm to those assets. So as we work our way back from incidents that we're trying to prevent, which starts with the critical asset identification, we can identify the insiders that have been granted authorized access to those assets and looking at the threats to those particular assets, identifying the threats and providing deterrent capabilities in place to deter insiders from either being motivated to cause harm or deter them from actually accidentally or non-maliciously causing harm. And if we can't identify these insider threats, what we wanna be able to do is to, to manage the human element. As part of our sessions yesterday, we heard about the behavioral aspects of insider risk management. We talked about the technical aspects. So as we look at the motivation, motivating factors, we may be able to do things to, to divert them off, which is typically described as the critical pathway to insider threats. And there's been a significant amount of work that's been done by researchers such as Eric Shaw, Laura Sellers. We've done work here that, that describes the critical pathway to the mitigation of insider threats. So if we can actually divert people off that critical pathway, that may then move them off them moving towards the insider incident itself. And that consistent response is critical. And then finally, as we work our way back, we want to certainly recognize that insiders uh, exist in organizations. We are all insiders to our organizations. We wanna make sure that we're recognizing that not all insiders pose a threat to the critical assets of the organization. So as we look to build strategies for insider risk mitigation, insider threat programs help to support that risk mitigation. And really what we wanna be able to do is to build a program that protects the organization's critical assets. We want to identify the external and internal threats and certainly make, make aware that the program exists, but not create a program that will alienate the entire employee population, the contractor population, and the folks that we describe as insider threats to the organization. 
So as we look to continue upon this, the definition that we use here that we've defined and has been pretty consistent for a number of years is an insider threat is the potential for an individual who has or had authorized access. And here's where we wanna differentiate between an insider threat and an insider incident. You know, the insider incident, something occurred, an insider was the cause of that incident and differentiate in another realm with the difference between insiders that don't pose a threat to organizations' critical assets. So our formal definition of insider threats is the potential for an individual who has or had authorized access to either maliciously or unintentionally, that gets to the point where malicious or accidental or non-malicious unintentionally act in a way that could negatively affect the organization. So just because you have insiders doesn't mean you have insider threats. Just because you have insider threats doesn't mean you will be the victim of an insider incident. You wanna build your risk management strategies appropriately to recognize the threats to the critical assets and put the appropriate level of controls in place to prevent and to deter and to detect and to remediate appropriately. And I would refer you back to the discussion from yesterday about the technical tools and the strategy discussion, as well as the, uh, the early session with what's new from the SEI around insider and insider risk management. So as we look to build what's described as, as kind of the threat matrix, you know, looking at the insiders, looking at the individuals, you know, we identify people as current or former employees that potentially could be a threat to your organization's critical assets. You know, court or former, we have a number of incidents in our incident repository where former employees have been able to cause harm after they were officially let go by an organization. So don't uh, assume that just because someone is no longer a formal employee, that they do not pose a threat to your organization's critical assets. But also recognizing insider as full or part-time employees, part-time, temporary, contractors, and generally anyone that you describe as a trusted business partner. And going back to the definition, anyone that has access or had authorized access to your organization's critical assets. And my, my hope is that as you integrate this into your enterprise risk management strategy, you have a formal process by which you identify your assets, you prioritize your assets, and you have asset inventories in place. You know, generally, we would describe as part of our, our resilience management model four general categories. Your people are critical assets, the facilities are critical assets, but also the information and the technology as well. So now we can start building the individuals who have authorized access to the critical assets and then look specifically at what they could do with malicious intent or unintentionally do as well. And what we've done over our 20 plus years of research is try to build these patterns. How do these incidents evolve over time? So we have models or patterns of insider fraud, insider theft of intellectual property, insider system sabotage, cyber sabotage, espionage, workplace violence, social engineering, accidental disclosure, accidental loss or disposal of equipment. So now we start working our way to what is the harm that could be realized and then look at the negatively affecting the organization, whether that is a harm to your employees, your facilities, whether that's specifically some type of degradation to your confidentiality or integrity or availability or the harm to reputation, et cetera. So now we have the ability to incorporate this into a risk assessment process when we dissect insider threats to the organization's critical assets. So Brett, back over to you to kind of pull this back into the more formal methodologies around risk and risk management. Sure, thanks Randy. And what I wanna uh, first tell everybody here is at the end of the presentation, there's a slide that provides references. And there are a lot of great assets in there that you're gonna wanna look at. Clearly the insider threat guide is gonna be there, but there's also some discussion about RMM, the resilience management model, and also Octave and Octave Forte and the suite that it provides. These tools I'm showing you in particular are from the Octaforte set, which is a uh, process that enables an organization to make connection between an insider threat, or excuse me, insider risk program or cyber risk program and bring it to that next level of enterprise risk. This tool in particular starts out uh, with a, on the next click, Randy, will show the scope of what we're trying to accomplish. Now, Randy provided you a lot of great information there. And you wanna kind of keep things simple up front at first, right? And bring more detail in as you progress and get more mature with the use of this tool. 
In this particular case, we just have a simple if-then statement to kind of bound the idea that we have an insider risk uh, that's in the organization or that we recognize there could be one. In the next step with the next click, what he's gonna show you is building out what we call risk tree or bow tie analysis. Now, this is not novel. It's been in the enterprise risk uh, management uh, tool set for a while, but it's how we're going to apply it over the next few slides where you're really gonna see some magic that might help you in your organization. So let's look at first what Randy had talked about and boil it down into some, maybe some practical, possibly contextual elements that are gonna make this uh, tool work for you. For example, in the blue boxes on the far left, you see risk triggers. Now these are events or things that could be happening that indicate that the risk is actually going to take place. So it's gonna enable that risk to take place. Now, the great thing about this is a lot of times these come along with key risk indicators. Those are like the, the stop signs or the, the street signs that you see on the way for this risk happening that can actually uh, tip you off that there are things that are afoot that this risk might be coming to fruition and eventually you could realize a consequence which is on the far right. Before you get there though, there's also a context or an environment at times where we could recognize that this is going to happen. So for example, uh, uh, you may have layoffs taking place in your organization. You may have a stressful time of year. Let's say uh, uh, you're a large merchandising uh, type uh, enterprise and you have like the holidays that are coming up. So there's a lot of stress and a lot of confusion and chaos where inner insiders could really take advantage of those opportunities. So we could document those conditions here in the center of the chart. And then as we look to the far right of it, we start thinking about how we could feel pain. Like how would these risks result in the organization actually uh, falling short of its ability to deliver on the objectives that it seeks? So maybe there are additional costs that come into play. Maybe there's a del uh, delay in your, your schedule or your ability to deliver. I wanna also point back one more piece here that is also called out not only in Forte, but in RMM as well, that might help you. To get to this point, Randy pointed out that we speak from the notion of having organizational, organizational objectives that are then decomposed into services that are then decomposed into assets. So you're gonna to wanna to look at like how we feel pain through the lens of those assets and how they're deprecated as this risk plays out, you will uh, begin to see the business impacts kind of come to light. So going to the next slide, I wanna start tying in the ransomware piece because we have now a lot of great information on insider risk. We see how we can break it down and decompose it into this high level tool that can kind of help us map out what's going on. Now, I don't think there's any surprises here. I think we're all familiar with ransomware as a malware in general, right? And it's the idea that we get heavy encryption placed on our system, you know, not willingly, obviously. And it's gonna deny us of our availability, confidentiality, integrity even possibly. Uh, and what we're looking for here is to understand uh, how those threat actors may take root in your organization. Maybe external, just as much as maybe internal. And as Randy said, it may be that it's a threat actor who is malicious as much as one that's ignorant. Okay, so we got to think about that as well. And by the way, there's a nice uh, uh, document here at the bottom if you want to learn more about that ransomware piece. But moving on to the next, let's bring more focus to the idea of how an insider could actually uh, abet or aid uh, this, this threat vector from getting your organization. You know, uh, uh, somebody who has extensive access across an organization can be a real pernicious problem. And suppose we have a scenario where somebody knows that they're going to eventually be walked out of the organization, maybe they're having a rough time of it, maybe there are layoffs coming, whatever the case may be, and uh, that ransomware could be uh, made latent somewhere in your system, right? So the, the challenge here is they can exploit known vulnerabilities, right? And they don't necessarily have to rely upon human failure or a lapse in awareness like you would have with opening up a phishing email. So this, this actually could be a far more pernicious threat in this regard, right? So it's more than just email. You need to think beyond that. And as we go to the next slide, what we can do is we can decompose this now into that next uh, um, bow tie analysis. So Randy's gonna bring up the scope piece. I think we have this laid out, right? We don't want our CIA to be denied. So what are we gonna do? So let's look at what those risk triggers may be, right? Now, clearly, this could be an issue of the external. So I felt like I had to put a little bit that there. But what we really want to think about, too, is, is our system segmented properly? Do we have the controls in place? And can they be exploited by people who are in the organization? They not only have the access, but they have the know of uh, the weaknesses in the organization. Okay? 
And uh, we would think that the environment that they would uh, take advantage of would be an environment where it's normal operations or business as usual. So they're going to try and figure out a way to exploit the enterprise uh, when it's least expected, I'm sure. Uh, now, the cool part about this, if you start to brainstorm uh, what the consequences are, and as we go to the next slide, you'll see that those right columns, that consequence piece is very, very similar, right? You, you are going to have uh, uh, maybe a delay in uh, being able to access your services. You're going to have potentially a bleeding down of, of uh, uh, critical assets in terms of information uh, or technology. Uh, at the end of the day, too, if they shut you down to a point where the organization comes to a grinding halt, there could be reputational damage. So what I want to do is connect in your mind the fact that there's interdependency in these risks. Between the ransomware bow tie that I showed you and between this, this additional uh, ladder one on, uh, excuse me, on insider risk and ransomware, you see that there are a lot of similarities here. Okay? Here's the great part. As a risk manager, what you could do is exploit the idea that there's interdependencies that exist and you can take credit for and or use similar controls, complementary controls and otherwise, to uh, uh, magnify the value of return on risk investment in your system. For example, maybe it's the idea that you have a great uh, backup uh, strategy in place where you would need that for not just force majeure type events, but a ransomware attack or as much as an insider uh, risk coming to fruition, right? And we can test that. We can run exercises uh, also and get ahead of that and understand uh, if those strategies are working. And you could like uh, demonstrate that there's greater value because you're uh, testing and uh, running a lot more understanding or gaining, excuse me, a lot more understanding of how that will play out uh, in terms of your ability to respond effectively. Okay, so moving on to the next, uh, I think another way to look at this is uh, we, we always talk about segmentation and we think about uh, uh, network architecture and how we can prevent insiders from even gaining that lateral access that they may otherwise have. So you may think about maybe a zero trust architecture of some sort. I would have been remiss without putting this in here because uh, in terms of the testing and things I had mentioned on the other slide, there are other response plans that you may be putting in place for other risk exposures in the organization where you could demonstrate once again that, that return on risk events investment where you're covering multiple, multiple risks, right? So we may start thinking about micro-segmentation in the system and how we're going to monitor uh, access in each of those segments and how we grant it. Uh, and can we keep it a dynamic policy? Can we uh, manage it such that uh, we can be sharper about knowing what employees are potentially at risk or uh, showing the fact that they could be a potential threat or want to exploit the system? Maybe they find out that they know that they're going to be uh, uh, laid off or something to that effect. And we can start zeroing in and, and limiting the access that they have to the system. So zero trust architecture just comes to mind. Once again, another resource at the bottom of the slide here that you guys can uh, tap and exploit. So actually, I'm going to turn it over to Randy at this point because he's going to give you a little bit more too on this response piece. Randy, let us know what you got on the insider risk piece. Sounds good. Thank you, Brett. Uh, so one of the opportunities that an insider risk program has is to potentially observe the behavioral element of insider threats. What we mean by that is that if you have an ability to potentially detect some of those motivating factors, you may have the ability, as we said earlier, to kind of divert them off that critical pathway to harming the organization. And if we look at the ransomware as a particular threat to an organization, ransomware, and as the name will imply, typically someone is motivated for some type of financial gain. That's the traditional scenario around ransomware. Now, if we look particularly at the motivating factors, an organization could potentially identify some of the potential stressors on the part of the individuals, your employees, some of those financial stressors, some of those professional stressors, or some of those stressors that might contribute to an insider's decision to benefit by harming the organization financially. Now, what we've done historically as we've built the models that we have, and they're publicly available on the SEI's website, is we've kind of built these models around how do incidents evolve over time. And looking at a parallel between ransomware and an IT system sabotage incidents, we do see a lot of similarities around the impact. We'll start there, the impact first. 
A system is not available. Something was rendered unavailable by the actions of someone or something. And particularly in those scenarios, a critical system or a critical file was impacted, whether it's encrypted in a ransomware scenario or if it's just uh, it's, it's changed it's modified or if it's in some cases just completely wiped out that would render a system unavailable so if we focus on the it system sabotage model and provide an overlay to a ransomware attack what we can do is try to describe how this may evolve over time which could help to inform your prevention and detection and certainly response strategies so for those of you who have seen our IT system sabotage model, we tend to build this model around individuals come into organizations with certain expectations. That could be a personal predisposition. There's some expectation of working for the organization, working with some expectations of what they have access to, et cetera. So when most of the time when individuals have those expectations met, they tend to be productive members of an organization. But in some cases that we've seen based upon the data, the incidents we've collected, when the expectations are not met, in some cases those are based upon a precipitating event. And as Brett described in the bow tie diagram in the previous slides, he talked about those motivating factors being to the individual, a, a someone that's being laid off, that someone fails to get a promotion, that someone is going through a merger or acquisition is impacting an individual. And in some cases, those precipitating events might lead to unmet expectations. And in some cases, in terms of IT system sabotage, those individuals become disgruntled. Now, in terms of the ransomware incidents, ransomware, as we said, it could be motivated by financial gain, but it also could be motivated by an ideological reason. Someone would choose possibly to sabotage a system to encrypt the critical systems or files because they're disgruntled against the organization could be one of those motivating factors. And what we try to describe as part of our IT system sabotage model, that disgruntlement, if it, uh, it, it is traditional in terms of what we've seen in these incidents, there are behavioral precursors that are available to the organization, that there could be coworker conflicts or supervisor conflicts, or they're coming to work late or they're leaving early or there's performance problems. And what we tend to describe in this particular scenario, those behavioral precursors if the organization is monitoring for those behavioral aspects, they're able to discover some of those behavioral precursors. And as we said, if we can work holistically across the organization with, for example, human resources and employee assistance programs, we could potentially reduce that disgruntlement and manage the human element of this particular risk and risk category. In some of these particular organizations that we've identified that have been victim of insider incidents to IT system sabotage, they sanctioned the employees with the goal of trying to stop the behavior that is of concern to the organization. But in these particular incidents, what it tended to do is escalate the disgruntlement on the part of the individual. You know, the escalation of disgruntlement tended to lead to the technical precursors of IT system sabotage. An individual got motivated to the point where they were able to deploy some malicious code a similar scenario of the ransomware that Brett described as well, or they went in and changed a configuration file, or they, in some other way, they wiped out a critical system file set that the organization needed to continue the operation of a critical system or a critical service. So in those particular examples, what we've seen is that the behavioral precursors were available before the technical precursors, which is why we tend to describe in terms of IT system sabotage, if you're relying upon the technology alone, uh, particularly with insiders that do have authorized access, you may not be able to prevent the incident because of the authorized access, you may only be able to detect and recover from it as well. So that's why we tend to stress in the human element, the behavioral precursors being available uh, and taking action on those behavioral precursors. Now, as those technical precursors uh, were, were exhibited by the individual, many times the insider threats, the insiders actually acquired these unknown access paths. They set up a particular path into the system. They created an unknown or unrecognized account or some system or the elevated privilege, which allowed the individuals to conceal that activity. So again, the insider with knowledge of what the organization was doing to detect was able to conceal that activity, which tended to escalate and increase 
the amount of technical precursors leading up to the attack itself. So as we describe IT system sabotage overlaying ransomware into this, the behavioral precursors may be available before the technical precursors that have set up the attack. Now, what we've seen in some of the organization is that if organizations are doing technical monitoring and they're doing behavioral monitoring, that could reduce the risk of an insider incident against the organization. But what we've also seen in the organizations that have had an insider incident is that they actually are differentiating or there's a difference between the actual risk of insider attack and the perceived risk of an insider attack. You know, if you're doing technical monitoring, you're doing behavioral monitoring, you could calculate the actual risk of an insider attack, whether that be IT system sabotage or whether that be a ransomware type attack. But unfortunately, organizations, the perception of their insider risk is different from the actual risk. And then in some cases is based upon the organization's trust of the insiders. Now, we're not saying you don't need to trust employees. You absolutely have to do that, but the trust but verify model is critical here. The organizations that tend to over trust their employees tend to reduce the amount of behavioral monitoring or the technical monitoring, which then allows the discovery of precursors to become even harder in that particular scenario. So that's how we would describe how IT system sabotage tends to evolve over time. And when we overlay a ransomware attack, a ransomware being motivated by financial gain or motivating, motivated by an ideological reason, we tend to see the impact being a disruption of a critical system or service. And you could possibly use this as a way to, you identify the behavioral precursors, you identify the technical precursors and put the appropriate level Level of monitoring uh, to uh, identify the technical aspects as well as the behavioral aspects as well. Okay, so with that being said, let's take a look at the tool and tool landscape. Certainly the insider threat tool landscape does vary in features and functions. The goal of tools are to prevent, to detect, and then to help in the response capabilities. There's a number of tools spanning the, the complete list, not a complete list, but a, a pretty extensive list that's identified here. Whether you do host-based monitoring, you do auditing of network activity, you do things such as data loss prevention, you preserve the forensic artifacts, there's rule-based alerting, there's identity management, access management. There's a number of tools that can help to complement your insider risk program. And as we said yesterday, the existence of a tool doesn't designate that you have a program, a program as a tool in your tool belt or tool shed that can help to, so, so, that can help to uh, make more effective your insider risk program. But really what you wanna do is build a defense in-depth strategy that has preventative strategies in place Really, the goal there is to stop something from happening. In that ransomware scenario, a tool that could prevent either malicious code being injected into a critical system or service or the modification of a critical tool set or the modification of some critical software or some application that's needed. So stopping the introduction of the malicious code that will in the ransomware scenario encrypt the critical systems or services but certainly having the prevention strategies in place alongside of the detection capabilities as well to detect in that ransomware scenario that something has happened, a critical file has changed. We're able to detect that as early as possible. And in the scenario that Brett talked about in that bow tie example, having a, a recovery capability that's as immediate as possible, recovering from the modification of a critical system or critical file, but also have deterrent effects in place as we look to incorporate the policies and the procedures in place, having things such as security awareness as part of that to training, discouraging an insider to be able to uh, go down that critical pathway to cause harm to the organization. And as we said, deterrent effects can also be in the form of employee assistance programs. You're looking at ways by which we can provide positive incentives to have organizations, employees motivated and aligned with the mission of the organization. And as we said, also the response capability is something uh, that is, is essential. The earlier you can detect, most times the, the, the less impact to the organization. And we certainly want to focus on a combination of prevention, detection, and deterrent and response tools that can help with this as well. So Gary, we talk in, that, in that regard, oh. uh, there was a question that just came up in, uh, on that previous slide. 
uh, you were speaking to the uh, actual insider risk versus the perceived. Uh, through our work, have we found that one is necessarily greater than the other? Well, what we found is that the perceived tends to be higher than the actual risk. Uh, the, the perceived percept, excuse me, let, let me take that back. Um, I, said that, I said that wrong. The actual risk is actually higher than the perceived risk. And that's that trust trap that we talked about before. You know, we perceive that the individuals are trusted. The idea is that we trust to the point where we think that no one would harm us as an organization. And then we tend to do less of the monitoring. So the more you trust, the less you monitor, both from behavioral and technical. And that tends to be the perception of risk is lower than the actual risk. And if you actually are doing the appropriate level of technical monitoring and behavioral monitoring, you would see that there's a difference. So the perception is lower, let me clarify that the perception of risk is lower from insider risk in most organizations than the actual risk, because organizations aren't consistently monitoring for the behavioral and the technical aspects of insider risk to organizations. Yeah, yeah, sorry about that. I misspoke at the very beginning, but it was, uh, yeah, that's a great question. Thank you very much for providing that. Uh, it's very important, thanks. Yep. So as we look to build this into those formal models that, that Brett talked about, again, identifying insider threats to the critical assets, and as Brett appropriately described and did a great job, the organization's mission is fulfilled by critical services and critical business processes and the assets that the organizations need to support the services and business processes, that's where we should focus on the monitoring strategies on the critical assets. Now, establishing an insider threat control baseline is important, looking at what we currently have in place and what we need to have in place to actually measure the risk to organizations' critical assets and where there are gaps, being able to fill those gaps in the control baseline. You know, at, at this point, we want to be able to measure the effectiveness of the insider threat controls and a great discussion yesterday about effectiveness and measures of effectiveness. Strongly suggest you consider watching the video from yesterday's day one of our insider risk management symposium, but also looking and refining and refreshing those insider threat control baseline as the threat landscape changes. As the technology changes, we need to make sure that our tools are able to be able to continue to keep up with the threat and threat identification. And that is a combination of tools. And we heard uh, yesterday we're talking about a combination approach, whether that be our SIM tools, whether it be our DLP tools, our UEBA tools, user activity monitoring, or EAM tools, you know, building a plan in place to build resiliency. It's the process plus the tools will lead to the higher degree of resilience. So with that, Brett, turn it back to you. Uh, real quick, I love that part of the discussion. And I want to point back to that risk tree or bow tie analysis real quick. You don't have to go back to it. But remember, in having that balance of tools, we could use some to get ahead of those triggers. In other words, the, the crystal ball effect, if you will, of looking for risks that could be on the horizon and making sure that that likelihood is reduced, just as much as we have to think about the controls downstream as the risk has resulted and we need to be able to respond. So I love that balanced discussion that you have here. It's critical and can be played out qualitatively at least uh, using the analysis that we've shown. Okay, uh, so we have uh, covered a lot of ground here today. And I think uh, it, over the next uh, couple of weeks, there are some things that you can think about. One is, I really think that we could start looking more to what our enterprise is actually doing. Do we have an enterprise risk program or are we trying to bridge gaps that may not necessarily be there? I think you're gonna find that there are folks who are like-minded who are thinking about these things in your organization. So just start looking around and maybe you're aware of those programs. If so, you're beyond that step and you're already starting to look at how you can knit these programs together so that way you get that winning complement of controls across the organization. Now, it may not be so much your part of the organization if you're in cyber, because we talk a lot about complementary controls and things of that nature. It's the idea of educating the rest of the organization as well, though, to recognize that you're bringing value to the table as much as they are, and that you can resonate better if you work together and uh, make sure that you're working in concert to reduce these risk exposures. So over the next few months, you could start looking at uh, the, the uh, tools that are provided in the uh, Insider Threat Guide and uh, these other uh, assets that we provided in the reference document. And you can start thinking about not just the response planning and the balance between them as we've talked about, 
But start thinking also about the degree of maturity that you're looking for in your organization and what you're trying to accomplish in terms of implementing a program that's effective and cost effective as well. So uh, I think we might have a question, Randy. Hold on one second. Okay. Okay. Uh, perception of risk is lower because we don't have the risk quantification. Is there a gap? Okay, so this is just speaking back to that uh, quantification, qualification gap, a trust trap portion of sabotage. Uh, is there anything that you've seen, Randy, in terms of having uh, uh, quantification of that trust piece in what we've uh, looked at before? Yeah, certainly, as we said, the, the trust trap that we described is really the perception of a lower risk than the actual risk to the organization. As we described in that model, that organizations tend to trust their employees or over trust without the verification. As you tend to monitor less, you tend to detect less. And that tends to then escalate to the point where we tend to over trust because we're not detecting as many of the, as many of those particular risk indicators. Now, as we look to quantify that, that is certainly some of the metrics that insider risk programs are challenged with. You know, what are the number of, for example, of alerts that are being generated? The automation of these particular uh, alerts that come out of tools could automate for the detection of the behavioral risk indicators or the te technical risk indicators. So as we see those trends and patterns over time, a tool that generates an alert, that's one of the metrics that we can use to measure consistency or increases or decreases over a period of time. So as we use that as one of the metrics of an alert of either a behavioral risk indicator or a technical risk indicator could be one of the metrics by which we're able to, to measure the effectiveness of the program. And also as we look to, to have the alerts, not all alerts go on to be a malicious activity on the part of the individual. Which of those alerts have been an inquiry? Which of those inquiries then resulted in a formal investigation? Which of those investigations eventually resulted in formal prosecution if there's malicious intent? So tracking those metrics of, in addition to just the alerts themselves, the severity of those alerts and what we learn to them, uh, learn from them going forward. And as we look to build this program and iterate the program, we need to be able to configure the tools appropriately to truly identify higher priority alerts that are generated out of these tools and lower priorities alerts that will come out of the tools as well. Yeah. So yes, so yeah, great question, thank you. Yeah, and that's a great discussion, Randy. And it kind of brings us back to the beginning slide where I talked about how the fact that this is you know, very much a team sport. So in the risk governance structure idea too, you're gonna to be having this discussion, not just amongst yourselves within the cyber organization, but maybe within HR possibly, within finance, within operations. Are there other uh, stakeholders that are maybe not as readily known uh, that, that we should consider as we're reaching out across the organization in that governance structure? Well, okay. certainly, yeah, as, as we look to build that holistic approach, uh, we want to make sure that there is, it's an enterprise-wide approach to this. As you describe human resources, physical security, information technologists, the risk component of the organization, but also looking across to the physical security folks, as well as managing the trusted business partners, having representation across the organization to include the business units. So when you build that insider risk management program, there's representation across the organization. And that's a great point, Brett, absolutely. Excellent, great. So uh, we leave you with some tools here. Uh, we uh, come bearing gifts, if you will. If you wanna dive deeper into any of these topics that we've talked about, I encourage you to uh, use these links and uh, make sure you, uh, if you have any questions, to radiate them back to the SEI and we're happy to reach out uh, we also have our contact information on the next slide. So if anyone uh, would ever want to reach out to us, please feel free to do so. I can do it through the SEI website uh, or email. Uh, and otherwise, uh, Randy, any closing thoughts? Nope. Thank you very much for your, your time and your attention. Certainly there's a lot of resources that are available on the Software Engineering Institute's website, as well as other references that are provided as part of our discussion today. So with that, thank you very much, Brett. It's been a pleasure talking with you today. We'll turn it over to Dan any uh, remarks before we go on break. Thank, Thank you, Randy. Thank you, Brett. That brings us to our morning session break. Please rejoin us at 12 o'clock Eastern Standard Time for a panel discussion on balanced approaches to insider risk management.
Hi, I'm Kirk Cerny, Insider Threat Specialist at FishTech. In today's threat environment, your organization needs to protect its intellectual property, trade secrets, data on customers, partners, supply chains, and the integrity of critical systems that underpin your operations and your reputation. In essence, these are your company's crown jewels. Protecting and safeguarding critical data and systems from external threats is one major task. But how do you also guard against your own employees and contractors who may trigger breaches or cause harm through malice or negligence or even unwittingly? The Sideris Insider Threat Detection and Response Service, ITDR, is the first managed service to address this kind of challenge head on. ITDR seamlessly blends technical and human behavioral indicators within a single analytics platform, providing a unique blend of cybersecurity firepower and AI-driven behavioral analysis that enables organizations to proactively mitigate their highest priority threats. With Sideris ITDR Managed Service, organizations will benefit from a system that accounts for the human factor in user behavioral analytics, filters out insignificant noise and false positives, prioritizes your highest risk insiders, leverages existing cyber and IT telemetry with no new data sources needed, supports investigators with analytically defensible evidence, is implemented rapidly to enable immediate insider risk mitigation. Our Insider Threat Detection and Response Service is the first of its kind. It's a human-led, machine-driven solution designed to be the foundation of any modern insider threat mitigation program. To learn more or schedule a demo, see us at fishtech.group or sideris.com.
Welcome back to the 2021 CERT Insider Risk Management Symposium. Next up on our agenda is a panel presentation titled Balanced Approaches to Insider Risk Management. Pleased to welcome back, pulling double duty today for us, Randy Trezak will be moderating this panel. Randy's going to introduce himself as well as our panel participants. Randy, thanks for coming back and back over to you. Thanks, Dan. I uh, appreciate it. It's great to, uh, to move into a different role now in terms of a panel moderator. As Dan described, this panel is focused on really on the balanced approaches to insider risk management. And it's my pleasure to reintroduce one of our insider risk researchers, Carrie Gardner, but also some other members of our insider risk management team that will be part of the panel, uh, panel as well. Uh, Dr. Bill Claycomb, Andy Moore, Luke Osterritter, as well as Michael Tice. And throughout our session today, we're asking them to provide some opening remarks, some opening comments as we look to frame what we describe as the balances of balanced approach to insider risk management. And as part of this session, like our other sessions, we do encourage you to ask questions. Uh, you have a panel of, of esteemed researchers here that uh, are ready and able and willing and encouraging you to ask them questions about the particular topic. So with that being said, we do wanna open it up to our first researcher, Andy Moore. Andy, if you would please provide your co opening comments related to the balanced approaches to insider risk management. Thanks, Randy, uh, and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this panel is addressing several dimensions of balance in insider risk management programs. For my part, I'd like to address the balance of proactive and reactive defenses to insider risk mitigation. By proactive, I'm really talking about prevention and deterrence, of course, and by reactive, uh, detect and respond. And when, we, when I refer to balance here along a dimension, uh, it does not necessarily mean equal rating, weighting, but rather that the approaches along the dimension uh, should be considered explicitly as in insider risk management decision making, and that the proportion of these approaches should be right for the organization's situation. So it's really dependent on the particular organization. The proactive and reactive dimension may seem a bit uninteresting or overemphasized, but some programs are really overly heavily uh, reactive in nature, uh, almost making prevention and detection, uh, prevention and deterrence an afterthought. Uh, there are significant negative impacts of imbalance of proactive versus uh, reactive uh, defenses. Of course, uh, insufficient reaction leads to um, leads to uh, a problem associated with um, significant damage before incidents are caught uh, or stopped. Uh, but insu insufficient proaction can also cause serious uh, negatives as well. For example, insider incident base rates may be higher than what they need to be. Uh, and in addition, similar incidents may recur over time because, uh, because the incidents ha have not led to improvements along the prevent and detect uh, lines of defense. I usually think very broadly in terms of proactive measures. Uh, traditionally, proactive measures include technical and procedural approaches to constrain user behavior. Uh, so, for example, hardening of systems or procedures, and also training and awareness programs for the workforce. But also included in proactive practices are support for struggling employees, uh, both personally and professionally. Uh, this is at the discretion of the employee, but uh, here we're talking about employee well-being being a central, central concern. Also, um, I would include here um, management, education, and training to constrain potentially problematic uh, supervisor behaviors. So supervisor behaviors that may exacerbate the threat. At the far end of uh, proactive approaches are those that consider the workforce's intrinsic motivation uh, to act in the interests of the organization. And here, uh, there's been studies done in organizational behavior literature uh, that call this uh, reliance on intrinsic motivation a self-regulatory approach. Uh, 
And because this self-regulation is tied directly to intrinsic motivations, these studies also provide evidence that um, there's a stronger influence that these, these self-regulatory approaches have a stronger influence on rule following than so-called command and control approaches. Uh, and this can be a dimension all of its own where you're balancing a self-regulatory approach with a command and control approach. Self-regulatory approaches may include, uh, may help in a number of ways. First, they can ensure that new hires uh, values align with that of the organization. Second thing, it can increase uh, the existing employee's commitment to the organization. We've discussed this in our past work as positive deterrence. Things like uh, improving organizational supportiveness, job engagement, or coworker connectedness. And third, they can promote uh, ethical behavior within the workplace, ethical decision-making. Uh, there was a recent talk in the SBS Summit uh, called Maybe It's Me, which uh, helped employees think about how their actions actually affected the workplace negatively and positive or positively and encouraged those, those positive behaviors. In conclusion, uh, organizations often think they're doing well enough in creating a positive workplace environment, but how do they really know? And shouldn't this be explicitly considered as part of the insider risk management problem? I think that they should. Uh, works, workplace surveys, for instance, looking at job engagement, satisfaction, uh, views of important issues such as privacy can augment this necessary understanding for understanding the attitudes of the workforce and how they're perceiving uh, the practices that are in place, uh, including those of the in internal or insider risk program. Maybe they're doing well overall, but even small poke pockets of maladaptive practice can be enough to cause serious insider risk issues. And considering prevention and detection and looking at these pockets of potentially bad practices is a critical part of a holistic insider risk management process. With that, I'll turn it back to you, Randy. Thank you very much, Andy. Uh, just as another reminder, uh, for questions for Andy about his opening comments. We'd be happy to take those in the question or the chat feature within the, uh, within the video. Happy to incorporate those as part of our panel discussion today. So feel free to keep those questions coming. Next, I wanna reintroduce Michael Tice. Michael Tice, Senior Lead Researcher here in the Insider Risk Team. Michael, your opening comments related to the balanced approaches to insider risk management. Thanks, Randy. I appreciate the opportunity to be talking today. Uh, I have kind of two areas of balance that I'd like to discuss. One is a balance in training, and I'll explain that a little bit in a moment. And the other is a balance between being discreet and sharing information, uh, both of which are going to be very important for the success of any insider risk program. Let me start with the training. So uh, I'm a retired counterintelligence special agent. And I did that for about 25 years. And back in the days before computers and cell phones and all of that type of thing, uh, we had to do these training and awarenesses inside of a large auditorium. So think about movie theaters and things like that. So we would assemble, I was in the uh, Department of Defense, so we would assemble everybody in there. And I had several areas of insider risk that I had to cover, like terrorism, how terrorists could influence an insider, sabotage, uh, sedition, insurrection, uh, treason, and of course, espionage. And, and I always felt like when I was doing that type of training, it was all about the government, right? It's sedition against the government. It's treason against the government. Uh, and there wasn't, didn't feel like there was a lot of good balance uh, about the individual themselves. So in other words, uh, you know, everything was national security and, and the audiences pretty much got it. But what I found to be more successful is when I started to incorporate how it applied to them specifically. So one of the things that I did, I had previously been in special, special mission units. So I was able to uh, mock up some mock explosives, you know, uh, painted uh, wood, stuff like that, and put it over the exits. And so we would go through all of that and tr we're trying to tell them why this is important to you and then show them, did anybody notice the exits when you came in? Did you notice your surroundings? 
and it made it really a lot more personal for them. So I thought, you know, when I started working in insider threat uh, back in about the 2001 timeframe, I asked myself, how am I going to balance this whole awareness thing about, hey, there are bad people, insiders, here's what to look for, and, and the person themselves and make it, uh, you know, to the person. So some of the things I thought about were security oftentimes tends to be more of a shock and awe type thing, right? Like these bad things will happen. If this happens, you know, the, the earth is going to stop spinning and everyone's going to fly off into space. So I, you know, I think that's important, but I think there has to be some kind of a balance of why is it important to the employee? What are we doing to, why is this going to help protect the employee? And so kind of like what Andy said, uh, balance doesn't mean like for every one statement about shock and awe, there has to be one statement about the employee and how it's protecting them. But overall, the message, I believe, has to be balanced in a way to where the person walks away feeling like this was important to me. I got something out of this. I'm glad I attended it. Now, I'd love to see a lot more research around this to see what is the mix and, and what are the themes that are actually going to stick to people or, or get them to feel like they're really part of this whole equation. Uh, but I have not been able to be part of that research. I, I would like to, you know, if anyone does that research, I definitely want to read it. Another part of the balance is between the protection of the organization and the protection of the employee. So when I talked before about the welfare of the employee, now I'm talking about like, how are we protecting the employee themselves? Uh, so if we're protecting uh, personally identifiable information, yeah, that's a uh, re responsibility of the organization, but it's also protecting the employee's personally identifiable information. So what we're trying to do is give that message that this isn't about us asking you to tell on your coworkers. It's about us asking you to help protect you. So that, that's kind of a balance that I look for. Same thing with you must report. So you must report everything uh, because it's your duty to the organization. In my balance, I want to kind of also drive home the theme that it's also your kind of duty to your fellow employee, right? So to help, you're not just protecting us, the organization, you're helping to protect your fellow employee. So I want to see a balance there. And then the last thing is, uh, I think that we oftentimes do in good insider threat training and awareness, talk about what the indicators are that somebody might be having a problem, that somebody might be in distress, that someone might need some help. And we want you to report that to the Insider Threat Program. I think that there's a good uh, opportunity there to ask about the person themselves. Like if you are feeling any of these things, if you are having any of these problems, here are some places you can contact. You can contact this, There's here's where the employee assistance program is. So it's not just about we're asking you to tell on others. We're asking you, are you okay? Do you need something? Is there something we can do to help you? My last area then is about uh, discretion. So the difference between being discreet and sharing information, and where do you find the balance in that? My, uh, most of my experience has been you have an insider threat program. You find something, you build a referral, and you send it off to the investigators. And what you get back is crickets. Right. And so, yes, you have to be discreet, but there has to be some level of sharing. Uh, and, and if the investigators are not going to tell me what happened in the situation, I kind of get that. But I still need to know, was the referral useful? Did I give you all the fields and information that you needed? If not, then tell me what was missing. So maybe like a feedback form with every referral helps you get that balance between, yes, they're being discreet about how they're handling it but you still want to get some information back to help you improve your program, help you improve the things that you're doing. And then the last thing is about uh, sort of what I just said about, uh, is it important to the organization or is it important to you or to your coworkers? When we talk about uh, sharing information or being discreet, and we're talking about, let's say I have to go to HR and uh, HR is then, um, you know, saying, here's some information uh, that we will share with you, but only uh, if you keep it discreet and you don't share it with anyone else, which makes perfect sense. We also want to make sure that when someone is sharing with us, that uh, let's say it's a, a regular employee, that they're sharing something with us and they're saying, hey, you know, I have this concern. I'm worried about my coworker. We shouldn't just shut the door and say, oh, thanks, click, and nothing back. 
we should find a way to give some kind of a feedback, even if still being discreet, but even being like, thank you very much for what you told us, that we found that very useful. Uh, you know, please uh, come back to us again in the future if you have any other concerns. So we don't have to say what happened to the person. We don't have to say what we actually did. We're still being discreet, but we want to give enough information shared back to keep that engagement going in the future. So those are basically my comments, and I look forward to the questions that will come in both those areas, balance and training, and balance between being discreet and sharing information. Thank you, Michael. Yeah, as Michael said, we encourage you to submit any questions or comments through the chat feature, through the question feature. Uh, next up on our panel, we're going to refer to Dr. Bill Claycomb. Uh, Bill, over to you for any re opening remarks around balanced approaches to risk management. Terrific. Uh, thank you, Randy. I appreciate it. Um, so uh, the balanced approach that I'd like to um, talk about is uh, from the detection side. So specifically uh, talking about um, the indicators that an organization might look for to detect potential uh, concerning behavior and, um, and, and how you can, uh, what, what, what different types of indicators those might be and the, the importance of having a balance in those indicators. Um, so a uh, very quick uh, background about myself. I've been working in insider threat um, detection for a long time. Um, most of it has been with uh, with actual customers. So um, in, in some cases, actually sitting with the analysts, um, not not doing the analysis, but sitting with them and, and conducting research on the actual data, the real alerts that organizations see. And, and some of these organizations have been small and some of them have been quite large. And so um, I've seen... Um, hundreds of different indicators uh, implemented, um, some well and some not. Uh, I've seen, uh, you know, tens or maybe even hundreds of thousands of alerts uh, that, that come in uh, as these indicators are deployed and, and as, as they uh, monitor, um, you know, the employee behavior on, on the organization's IT systems, then alerts are generated. And, and we use, uh, we use those configurations and, and those alerts to try to improve um, the efficacy of the indicators that uh, that the customers have. <clears throat> so the, the two different types of indicators that I'll talk about briefly are, um, as we refer to them in the training that, that we do at CERT, are uh, technical indicators and behavioral indicators. Um, and that, that's a that's a good general way to uh, separate the different types of things you're looking for. Um, and usually, what we mean is is you're looking for something that that is uh, happening on the the IT systems would be the technical indicators and something that, that is more um, interpersonal or, or related to the person's behavior or, or um, even, even um, you know, outside circumstances um, like uh, financial difficulties and things would be, would be behavioral indicators. Um, <clears throat> but in reality, uh, a lot of times we're talking uh, and, and it's confusing, especially we've had, we have this question quite a bit with, with our, our students when we do training is, uh, you know, what about a, a, an indicator that you consider to be behavioral that is actually monitored on a technical system? Is that technical or behavioral? So an example might be looking for inappropriate uh, web use, right? People surfing uh, the web on their company machines that they're not supposed to go into sites they shouldn't go to, right? So that's detected by a technical means, but it, it, it represents a behavior um, of, of the individual. Uh, and so they're, they're really uh, a lot of times are both uh, technical and behavioral. Um, <clears throat> so it, again, to sort of highlight the difference, uh, uh, I was trying to think of an example of a primarily technical uh, indicator or, or a situation that, that I've seen in the past. And there was one that's very memorable. Um, the, the organization had the capability to not only monitor what the employees were doing on their uh, systems, but actually to capture the, the screen, the vi a video of, of the screen uh, as, as the potentially um, suspicious behavior was, was occurring. And so was able to actually watch uh, a system administrator for this organization received an email uh, that, that claimed to be from um, UPS or FedEx or, you know, some, some sort of, uh, and, and it was, uh, you had an attachment, you know, important information about your delivery. Um, and it was a Word document. And so we watched on the screen, and this is not happening in real time, this is recorded, but uh, the sysadmin clicked on the attachment and it came up and, and um, it, there was a warning box that said, hey, uh, this is a macro enabled document. And are you sure you want to enable macros? Now, hopefully everybody that's listening is saying to themselves, no, 
No, the answer is always no. Never. You don't want to do that. Why not? Why? Because there, there's there's viruses. And well, the sysadmin didn't choose that. He uh, clicked OK, and the document opened and closed uh, almost instantaneously. So what did he do? He did it again. Clicked yes, document opened and closed. And sure enough, it was malware. There was a there was an infection, and and so that that's a pretty clear technical indicator. Now there's some behavioral concerns there, like do you really want a sysadmin that would do that working for you? But that's primarily technical. Another one might be looking for uh, potential exfiltration of, of intellectual property. You know, somebody um, attaching uh, a document to an email or or, or using their personal uh, email, uh, webmail, or, or Dropbox. Right? Do you, do you, does your organization monitor the information that's leaving? Um, and I'll come back to that in just a minute, but uh, behavioral indicators are, are different. Um, and so uh, an example of that would be a, a different organization um, that was able to monitor uh, employees' communication and email and, and chats within the organization. And there was an employee that that sent a, a you know, instant message to another employee that included the phrase, sometimes I just, I just think about coming in and starting to shoot people. And the other employee wrote back and said, okay, um, you don't really mean that. And, and you shouldn't say things like that. You shouldn't joke, joke around like that. And the first employee wrote back and said, no, I, I don't think I'm joking, right? And so clearly that's a very a serious issue and a very serious uh, potential for workplace violence, which is a type of insider threat. Um, and, and fortunately, the organization was able to mitigate that, that circumstance. But, you know, good thing that they, that they caught it and were able to see it. And that's definitely a behavioral indicator. Um, so why do we want to have both technical and behavioral indicators in our insider threat programs? So what, what, why is it important? Um, you know, a lot of times organizations are just concerned about data loss and, and people doing bad things to their systems. So why not just put a bunch of controls in place and indicators to look for people doing bad things to their systems? And, and there's several reasons why having behavioral indicators is, is uh, very valuable. Um, a long time ago, and I, I, I won't quote the year because I don't remember exactly, but uh, CERT did some work um, and, and the people uh, in this panel, some of the people on this panel did work with uh, Dr. Eric Shaw uh, to create what's called the critical pathway towards insider risk. And that critical pathway says, among other things, that typically you'll see more behavioral indicators um, of a person's um, potential concern before you'll see their technical indicators. And, and some follow-up research that we did uh, tended to confirm that. So... Um, uh, Andy Moore, one of our one of our other panelists, you, you heard from, um, led some work uh, also uh, around that time to develop models of, of IT sabotage. And again, what uh, what those models showed is that the the precursors to uh, the malicious behavior uh, were often behavioral precursors, um, and it include disgruntlement and things like that. Before there were there were technical precursors, not always, but a lot of times there are warning signs that show up from behavioral. Um, indicated behavioral clues. Um, Michael Tice uh, led some work uh, for, for DARPA. Uh, well, he, he led CERT's effort uh, for DARPA for a project um, that, that involved insider threats. And one of the tasks that they were doing was, um, well, I, you can read the paper, uh, but, but, but the, the, to get down to the details, they needed to look at real data and they needed to find an example of a system administrator who was disgruntled uh, and who was concerned about potential layoffs. Um, not a specific person. They just needed an example. And they were able to find it, in, again, within an organization's real data by looking for these behavioral indicators, but looking for the way that, that people use language. They found it, it didn't take very long to find somebody who was disgruntled and worried about potential layoffs. Um, so the warning signs are there. The warning signs of disgruntlement, um, uh, again, going back to, to Eric Shaw, he, he says disgruntlement is a combination of anger being angry and feeling victimized and having somebody to blame. And a lot of times that can be the organization, right? Do, do you think there's any disgruntlement out there right now um, with the, the current uh, hot topic issues going on? Um, you know, government, uh, government organizations or government contractors, you know, vaccines, right? This is, these are real hot topic issues. And, and there are definitely going to be some, some different opinions and people feeling angry and victimized and, you know, pointing fingers. And so uh, the, these are things are out there and it's important for organizations to catch them early. Um, real quick to wrap up, um, some things to consider when, when you're thinking about as an organization uh, implementing technical and behavioral indicators is a lot of times technical indicators 
uh, may already be implemented, right? Data loss prevention programs may already have the, the way to identify data loss and things like that. Um, your your uh, network operations center, things like that, uh, may already collect a lot of the data that you can use for technical indicators. Behavioral indicators, maybe not so much. And, and unfortunately, behavioral indicators tend to be less precise. Mo most indicators will generate lots of alerts that, that aren't actually malicious behavior. I, and I, I'm not exaggerating when I say more than 99 to 99% of the alerts that, that most indicators generate are not actually malicious behavior. And, and that's a that's a low ball estimate. All right, so analysts are gonna be sorting through a lot of stuff. Behavioral indicators tend to generate a lot more of those uh, alerts because they're less precise, because maybe they're looking for specific words like uh, shooting, like I'm, I'm gonna come in and start shooting. So you might, you might um, monitor communication for the word shooting or shoot, right? But I'm going to shoot you an email is a totally innocuous phrase. Um, killing, right? This is one of my pet peeves. Killing is a lot of times a word that, that organizations might use. And for some reason, everyone in the world likes to use the phrase, you're killing me, Smalls, from the movie The Sandlot, right? It, it just, it, I, won't do, I, won't, I won't give you statistics on how many times that is uh, not a concerning alert. Um, but I will say, um, to my, my final point will be, the behavioral indicators um, take care and, and, and often special training to interpret and to make decisions on whether they're actually concerning. And so it's important for organizations to have people uh, on their insider threat team and insider threat analyst team that have uh, not only the technical skills, you want people with the technical skills to understand what's being done on the system, but you need also people with the psychological background, the behavioral science background, uh, to, to be able to analyze and, and interpret um, the behavioral things that are that are going on. So with that, I will uh, turn things back over to you, Randy. Thank you. Well, thanks, Bill. Appreciate your comments, your feedback. And again, just encouraging the audience to spend any questions or comments through the chat or the question feature. Happy to address them at the end of our panel session today. So next up, I do want to reintroduce you to Carrie Gardner. Uh, you saw her yesterday. Thank you so much, Carrie, for doing double duty yesterday and today and being part of our panel. I'd love to hear your thoughts and ideas, your opening remarks around your balanced approaches to risk mitigation, inside risk mitigation. Absolutely, thank you, Randy. Um, before I dive into my content, I actually just kind of want to follow up um, to one of Bill's remarks there at the end, um, you know, on keyword detection. Um, that's a critical example of why context matters. And particularly when we're talking about text analytics monitoring, um, staying abreast of the latest trends in how natural language processing um, can utilize, you know, full context windows essentially of communications. That's a, a state of the art technology you really want to consider um, and kind of verify that whatever text analytics solution that you have uh, included in your uh, monitoring solution stack. Um, you know, what are the limitations and what are the opportunities uh, to kind of get at the full picture of the communications um, that are being collected and monitored. Um, you know, to, to Bill's point there, um, there's definitely limitations in our ability to pick up something malicious from single words. Um, you know, many words can be used innocuously, as you said. Um, so that's why, you know, really digging in, understanding, you know, how these technologies work is fundamental. And actually gets me to one of my points um, today. So um, I kind of prepared material uh, more focused in on privacy trade-offs with insider risk and security. Um, I know I mentioned yesterday uh, talking about usability. I'll table that for today. Um, for folks that follow me on the Open Source Insider Threat Community Group or OSIT, um, let's make that an agenda topic in an upcoming meeting. Um, and for those that are not part of OSIT already, uh, please reach out. I'd love to have you join. We've got a group of over 600 practitioners um, and always looking to add more folks uh, to that community. Um, so as I mentioned, let's talk about, you know, the so-called balance of privacy and security. And, you know, I, I want to dig into that because this is kind of a, a pet peeve of me just in, in my research and my work here on the team. Um, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, well, you know, insider risk, you know, it's your privacy, big brother, you know, it's, you know, violating all these privacy concerns. And it's a much, much more complicated and bigger picture um, than what that, you know, framing suggests. You know, it's not just, you know, binary trade-offs. Um, and even I would claim that privacy is not necessarily uh, on the same level as security. 
Um, I go back uh, kind of picking up some uh, scholarly thought from the policy and the legal communities. And I take the perspective that privacy risk management is talking about normative choices that our governance bodies have passed and enacted. Whether that be you know, at the federal level, and we have legislation, we have regulations from different federal agencies, you know, various state uh, regulatory policymaking bodies, to even your own organization, having their own governance uh, values and choices. Um, policy and privacy is very uh, governance driven. Um, and so these requirements vary. And when we're talking about the US, um, we're talking about a patchwork. There is not a single GDPR like uh, regulation. Um, and so that's where things get even more complex. Where we're talking about different jurisdictions, we're talking about different um, requirements spanning different scopes of laws and regulations, such as through employment law, uh, anti discrimination law, uh, consumer protection, etc. So that's why I think, you know, we start to get this um, complicated picture of, you know, what are current uh, privacy requirements. And then you counter that with security which security is more that the controls, the enactment of uh, engineered um, measures to actually enforce uh, you know, some of those privacy policy decisions, but also risk management um, decisions. So security, in my perspective, is more of that the controls, um, the implementation of the decisions, uh, both on the privacy and the risk management side. And I think that's a critical distin distinction to make um, and, and monitoring or surveillance, if you want to use that term, is a, a type of control, a type of security measure. Um, you know, you just can't just say that, you know, it's either privacy or security even, um, because security is much, much more than that, than just monitoring on its own. Um, so that kind of gets us into, you know, what is risk management? You know, we've been talking about this for the past couple of days here. Um, I'll, I'll frame it here as something that's more normative and values based. We're kind of um, prioritizing how we want to allocate our resources to addressing different types of potential uncertain losses an organization may face. These could be financial, operational, or on our field, more cybersecurity, insider risk specific. Um, so, you know, governance bodies, you know, our uh, leadership, our decision makers gets to make and enact uh, a priority of different types of practices to then mitigate that potential loss. And then they select different security controls and control sets in order to do so. So with that, you know, and with that framing there, um, I, I do claim that this uh, balance of security and privacy really is a, a false choice. Um, but if, you know, there's a valid argument when, you know, folks are talking about trade-offs with the monitoring side of security. And let's dig into that because, you know, there's different um, privacy protections that have been passed through those policy making and governance bodies in order to mitigate the potential trade-offs or at least to help us understand what those requirements are for protecting privacy in a safe and secure manner. So, you know, you can look to uh, different federal and state organization privacy policies. Some of it, as I mentioned, you know, may come on the employment side, the anti-discrimination side. Heck, it could come from consumer protection and thinking about the collection, the use, and the dissemination of different personal information. When we talk personal information, um, this again ties back to, you know, what standard um, that you're bounded to. Um, so if we're talking HIPAA, you know, that has something, a specific definition of PII or personal identifiable information. Likewise, if we're talking about uh, CCPA or the new California Consumer Protection Act, there's a specific definition. So the requirements of what is considered PII, personal information, does vary and does change. Um, so with that, you know, um, this just reinforces the need for organizations um, to stay close to the law, to the you know, general counsel, HR, privacy uh, programs within their organization, um, build those close relationships, and they should be part of, you know, every single critical decision. Um, I'm about to wrap up my section, but I, I do want to share um, something, you know, I would like to talk more about perhaps later um, in this session is the need to have a burden of proof standard. Um, you know, this is something, you know, the legal community has, but if you, you know, follow crime shows on TV, probably heard a reference to this. Um, you know, the, the judge goes and gets a warrant to arrest someone or to search someone's home. And there's a similar analogy to be had here with insider risk investigations and inquiries. 
Um, and I think it's at the nexus of the privacy and the so-called security trade-off is where we're establishing that criteria. We're setting the you know, substantive evident evidentiary requirements for actually pursuing further steps and collecting further information. Um, so that's something I, you know, I just, I'll, I'll leave you with there. Um, I'll turn it back over to you, Randy. Um, but that you know, distinction there it, it isn't as, um, you know, it, it's more than just security versus privacy. It's a, it's a deep issue and it's a complex one for organizations to consider. Thank you very much, Carrie. Uh, great, uh, great opening comments. So I do want to thank the audience members who have submitted questions. We're collecting those, we will get to those, so keep them coming. Uh, as we get to our last uh, panel, uh, our panel participants, I certainly want to reintroduce Luke Osterreiter. Certainly uh, encourage him to provide his thoughts and ideas on the balanced approach to insider risk management. So, Luke, turn it over to you, please. Awesome. Thank you so much, Randy. I really appreciate it. And I'm uh, very excited to be part of the panel. Um, so what I'm going to cover today uh, will maybe sound familiar uh, if you've been paying attention for, you know, the last two days. Uh, but that's, there's a reason for that, right? And that's because these are important uh, topics that I think um, are really important to think about as far as understanding um, what is meant by having a balance in insider risk and insider threat study and, and sort of how we kind of uh, get a little closer to that. Um, so the first thing I'd start off with is just to say, you know, both in research and in practice, uh, there's kind of been a shift, right, from talking about insider threat to insider risk. Um, and, you know, cynically, you might think, oh, that seems like marketing to me, right? Because, you know, there is sort of this issue with insider threat kind of feeling uh, maybe like a little us versus them, right? Organization for, versus employee. Um, and to a degree, maybe that's uh, correct, but there's a little more to it than that, right? Um, so when you say insider threat, uh, that implies that there is an active threat, right? That implies that you're doing threat hunting, um, that there is some sort of problem within your organization and you're on your way to, to find it, right? Um, but if we think about what is insider risk, uh, we're getting a little closer to um, the, the study of risk management, right? Um, so, so if you're thinking about insider risk, you're now thinking, uh, you're taking a little step back, right, from that individual, and you're thinking more about um, your organization as a whole, thinking about resiliency, um, you're thinking, you know, how do I trust my employees who, you know, I've hired to do a job and have, you know, uh, the, 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 there is a requirement there of, of, of sort of empowering them and giving them that trust uh, while also taking steps to minimize potential harms, right? Um, so you kind of step away from this, um, you know, I have a hammer kind of thing and just sort of get back to, okay, I'm going to have to uh, figure out some equation where I figure out what's my acceptable amount of risk uh, and I try to make that equation work for my organization. Uh, to go further, right, this is not just cybersecurity, it is cybersecurity, uh, but it's a little more than that, right? So um, a lot of what, what my research has been um, is what the broader uh, Carnegie Mellon campus effort has been um, working along with uh, Dr. Kathleen Carley and the, the Casos and Idea Centers on campus. Uh, we've been thinking about this through the lens of what we're calling uh, social cybersecurity. And so what we mean by that is we're trying to, you know, understand how cyber-mediated threats um, affect individuals and, and organizations? And then also, how do we defend, right? How do we defend against cyber media threats and sort of retain essential characteristics uh, of who we are um, in this, you know, very uh, internet uh, pervasive world that we find ourselves in? Um, further, right, it's, it's, it's much harder to mitigate an insider threat than it is to manage insider risk, right? Uh, and what I mean by that is a, a lot of what we do that it's a technical control, uh, it's important, but it's also reactive. So a lot of times we'll find an insider threat or we'll find evidence of, of malicious behavior after the fact, uh, but you can't unring the bell, right? Um, whereas, you know, if you were to uh, somehow prevent the bell from being rung at all, then uh, the, the, the resulting uh, situation that you would find yourself in might be more favorable to you. Um, so if you accept that, then you might ask, okay, then how do I man manage this risk, right? Um, and and to, to put a pithy statement to that question, I would just say, uh, you know, happy people don't commit sabotage. And so there's a lot of factors that go into, you know, why someone might do something counterproductive, per, you know, partake in a counterproductive workplace behavior. 
Uh, and there's not really a one-to-one -one between disgruntlement and insider threat. I don't mean to insinuate that, right? Uh, you may be disgruntled, you know, with many, many, many people, I'm sure, are disgruntled without ever taking action against their organization. Um, however, there are precursors, right? Um, so, so Andy mentioned, right, there's these precursors that, that have been identified to malicious insider threats, things like, um, you know, stressors affecting employee well-being, uh, not being connected at work, uh, having kind of not uh, great connection between, you know, what it is you do for work and what, you, what it is you want to do, and also lacking that perception of being supported by your organization. Um, so what can you do, right? You, you want to work as an organization to help provide, um, you know, help and assistance for those people, uh, making sure they have the resources to address um, what did, what those stressors are to them, right? Things like your EAP programs and, you know, just making sure that, that you have certain flexibility for people, right? So like, like for me, right? Like I have a two-year-old son uh, and, and in the world that we find ourselves, right? You know, if there's um, some sort of <laughs> a global pandemic and I have to keep him home for a little bit, uh, that's a stressor on me. So if the organization can help me out in some way uh, with, with being able to care for him while I, I do my job, then you know that that goes a long way towards uh, making sure that I remain a happy person and I'm able to actually do my job right. So this is a two for one, right? Uh, you make sure that you have folks who are free to do their job with, that they need to do, and you make sure that they are not, um, you know, getting to the point where they would become unhappy. Um, so you, you strengthen the workforce and you reduce risk, and, and I think overall that's very good. Um, it's been mentioned already in this panel, but uh, currently the, uh, the SBS Summit is going on right now. Um, it's really a really terrific set of talks uh, that I would highly recommend you check out. Um, around the theme around is, is sort of around cultural intelligence, right? Um, and how you sort of um, can use that as a way to build organizational culture in a, in a positive way. Um, so yeah, again, I would certainly recommend that. Um, I'd like to go back to talk about also, you know, it can be easy to focus on the technical aspect, uh, and that's important. And it's not to say that it's easy, but it's it's sort of immediately you can have data, right, if, you, if you're collecting things. Um, but at its core, insider risk is a sociological and organizational problem and a problem of management, right? Um, so no matter, <laughs> uh, you can't write an IPS rule to solve an employee's, you know, health, monetary, or, or child care problems, right, can you? Um, but what you can do is you can partner with HR, you can partner with organizational leaders, team leaders, uh, and external partners to help, you know, recognize when that kind of support is needed, when those stresses are occurring, and then also provide that support. Um, never has this perhaps been more top of mind as when, you know, as, as, as a part of this COVID-19 pandemic, right? You know, at some point we were all asked, hey, gotta get out, go home, we'll work from there, right? So that was a, an amazing stressor. Um, but now we've all sort of fallen into these routines where we've sort of, you know, as much as we could, we've, we've adapted, we've changed, and we've mitigated those as much as we can. Um, and so we're now kind of at a new inflection point where we need to really think about, um, you know, I think a lot of times the, the impetus uh, or the inclination from an organization might be, okay, time to pull those people back in now that the, you know, vaccines are, are at the forefront and, and things can, um, you know, we're starting to meet more in person. Uh, however, we need to really think really hard about doing that, right? So that might be the right answer for your organization, um, but you have to know, right, that we've already got folks who are in these kind of new routines that they've made work for them. Um, and so flipping that coin back to its original side uh, can bring about a new set of stressors that we really want to think about um, as we make our decisions. And lastly, one thing that I think kind of gets um, sometimes forgotten is, is this idea of unintentional insider risk. Uh, and that really should also be a priority. And what I mean by that is, you know, this is when, um, because you are, uh, either because it's, an, uh, you didn't know that the information was important or you just sort of forgot or, or you left something in your car and it was stolen. Um, this is the kind of insider risk that is not intentional. There's not malice behind it, um, but it can happen due to, you know, a lack of care or lack of understanding of, of what you're really holding, right? Um, and so, I think it's important to think about, you know, really empowering employees, uh, engendering buy-in with them and making sure that they understand, hey, listen, you know, um, what you are working on is, is, you know, very important property, intellectual property. Um, we need to treat it as such and, and make sure that, you know, we're thinking about that even 
if you know we're not necessarily in the office, right? right? Um, especially as we, we find ourselves at home more and more. Um, and so if, if we enlist them to help safeguard it, then uh, that brings us a little closer, I think, to uh, mitigating insider risk in a very meaningful way. Um, and with that, I think I'll throw it back to you, Randy. Sounds good. Thank you very much, Luke. I do want to thank the audience for submitting questions. I was able to take the questions that were submitted, compile these, and I'm able to direct one question to each of you panelists. So just want to give a little bit of a heads up to each of our panelists that we'll get a question related to your topic. Uh, let me begin by starting with, with Bill. So you talked about being uh, sitting alongside of insider threat program implementation and operation. You know, one of the questions that came in was around the area of sentiment and sentiment analysis. And have you seen that been have you seen that being effective in organizations? Are there any type of thoughts or ideas around sentiment analysis to contribute to insider risk mitigation? Yeah, thanks, Randy. Sentiment analysis is something that comes up quite a bit uh, when, we, when we talk about insider threat uh, risk mitigation. Um, it's not usually something that that we list among the, the um, primary list of controls uh, or, or detectors that an organization should put in place. And that's not to say that it's not useful. It's just it's just really tricky. Uh, it's it's not a simple thing to do. Um, but we, we have done a lot of research on it. Uh, and I guess what it comes down to is is you know th there are lots of different sentiment analysis techniques and tools out there, um, open source tools, uh, proprietary tools. Uh, you know, to, to judge sentiment, basically, whether it's, whether something is positive or negative, that, that's not that's not very difficult, right? Um, but that's not usually what an insider threat program is, is interested. They're interested in some of the things that I talked about earlier, anger, disgruntlement, and things like that. That's a lot, that's a lot more difficult uh, to do. And there are, um, you know, there's a lot of considerations that go into an organization's ability to do that. Uh, a lot of it depends on the data, what, what type of data are available. Um, how much of that data is available. Uh, if the data comes from different different um, sources, maybe it comes from email or, or uh, uh, chats or, or, or web-based chats, things like that, how easy is it to, to be able to link the, the, uh, the text that a person types between those, those different systems? Um, so uh, I guess what, what I would say is that, you know, sentiment analysis by itself, is 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 useful in in limited cases, and we've seen it be be used uh, successfully. Um, but but it generally takes a long time to tweak it and and make it useful for that organization. It's a lot of times very specific to the population, very specific to the organization. Um, where where it is most useful, I would say, is is not in detecting a specific instance of uh, you know negative sentiment. Right, it's mo most useful when you're able to to baseline uh, each individual's you know sentiment or or categories of sentiment over time and notice changes in that sentiment. So a person that that tends to always be angry um, might not be as concerning as a person who who usually isn't angry and then over the last week or so has really become considerably more so. So that's where we see it most most often um, being effective is, is detecting changes in 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 people's feelings over time. And, and, and for, for that, you don't have to be as precise in measuring specific sentiment of specific messages. You can, you can you know, uh, aggregate it and, and, and uh, use it, um, more data to, to develop the, the indicator. So um, hopefully that answers the question. Uh, and um, thanks, thank you. Yeah, thanks very much. Uh, next question, Andy, a uh, question has come in related to your opening comments. Uh, you talked about the proactive approaches that contribute to insider risk mitigation. Uh, how about an organization that is currently struggling with insufficient resources, whether it be people or time or money? You know, that seems like to me an additional scope. You know, how do you address that adding scope at the time that insider risk, insider threat programs may be limited in resources to address the positive approaches? Right, thank you. That that's an awesome question. Um, you know, a lot of people might consider those, you know, essential core function of human resources, and uh, you know that's probably true. Uh, the organization really needs to consider in the insider risk management program uh, these kind of functions as well, because HR is a is a component of the program. And the organization needs to consider kind of cross-organizational expenditures to, to be able to 
uh, manage insider risk. Managing insider risk involves a proactive prevent, detect, or prevent and deter, as well as you know the re detect and respond parts of that. So, you know, if you look cross organizationally, it's really no more resources than the organization's already spending. It's just a matter of making sure that the the in insider risk management portion of the organization or uh, program of the organization is, is considering that as part of their management activities. Well, thank you, Andy. So building upon that, Luke, if you don't mind, I'll kind of transition to your topic as well. You know, Andy kind of described the positive approaches, the positive incentives, building this culture to have more of a positive nature. Uh, a question did come in around empowerment, empowerment of employees, getting them connected to their job, to their coworkers, and to the mission of the organization. So do you envision that that potentially could lead employees to possibly feel maybe from an empowerment standpoint above the rules and maybe that power that you're giving may go to their head and that may cause the unintended consequences that would expect to reduce the insider risk. So any thoughts or ideas about that, please? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I get that. Um, my response to that would be, you know, um, you kind of, you, you try to hire good people to do good work. And so when you empower them, you also, what comes with that is, is some, no, some notion of accountability, right? Um, so it's all part of a balancing act. Um, you try to, you know, hire these people in to, to do the job. You, you trust them, right? You, and that's part of the risk calculation uh, to do what they need to do to work, um, you know, while putting in the, to action the technical and social controls as appropriate um, for your organization and, and for your risk calculation. So, um, you know, it maybe it comes down to trust but verify. But I, I think that's I think that's how you have to go because I, I think that not empowering them is worse. Yep. Okay. So the uh, the next question, if you don't mind, directing it to Carrie, uh, related to mature programs in the championing and protecting workforce privacy while maintaining monitoring capabilities for threat detection. So that question came in. Do you have any thoughts or ideas about how you can do it? What is the balance between the two? Absolutely. Um, I would answer this uh, two parts here. First on governments, second on uh, training and awareness campaigns. Um, so as I was mentioning, you know, in my opening remarks, governance is critical. Um, it starts from the top. Um, you know, it's not only incorporating laws and regulations that organizations need to abide by, but it's also incorporating the organization's own values um, and their internal policies and how they align themselves with different frameworks um, and internal frameworks. Um, so organizations need to make sure that they have clear um, and uh, updated policies, practices, and procedures um, for a variety of topics, but critically for insider threat investigations and inquiries. Um, this content and these you know, documents do need to be signed off uh, routinely by all critical parties and stakeholders, uh, specifically legal and HR. Um, they need to have eyes on you know, where the current practices for actually opening an investigation carrying out um, different evidence collection steps and, you know, formally, uh, you know, taking the, the, the case the next step. Um, so there needs to be, you know, very intentional uh, measures taken to actually implement and create, and then also maintain and update those governance documents. Um, and, and kind of along with that, thinking about um, oversight, you know, whether that's internally, you know, and if it's like a federal agency, there's an inspector general's office, um, but making sure there's a healthy relationship um, between the inside threat program um, and whoever is overseeing and kind of evaluating the performance um, and the maturity of the inside threat program actually carrying out its mission. Second part on training awareness, it's you know, critical for um, insider threat programs to be able to have a, a clear and consistent message about what is and isn't done with the data that's being collected and, and assessed. Um, you know, employees and or workforce members shouldn't be wondering whether or not um, the data and their activity on their mobile device or their email um, is being collected. They should have that information present and readily available to them. Um, and this is also a point just in building trust with the workforce member and organization. Um, you know, sometimes I've heard, you know, complaints before that, you know, they're not quite sure uh, what type of activity uh, or user activity monitoring is happening on um, that mobile device that they have um, the employer account on. They shouldn't, you know, be having questions about that. That information should be readily available. And by trying to hide that information, 
And in some ways, that's actually breaking down trust between the, the workforce member and the organization. So there's various ways where inside care programs can really build upon and champion um, privacy rights that you need to know, and then also protecting the organization's insider risk management processes. Thank you, Carrie. We do have time for one more question. One more question just came in. Michael, if you don't mind, I will direct this to you, and it's related to risk assessments, uh, insider risk assessments or workflows. Is there any any considerations or recommendations that, that you would have being involved in programs? How do you assess uh, overall the effectiveness of insider risk programs and organizations? Well, that is a great question. Uh, so we have done a lot of work on this uh, from a from the scientific perspective of developing uh, different instruments that could be used for that. And Carrie mentioned some of those on the panel yesterday about we do an insider threat program evaluation. But more recently, uh, CISA, the Cyber, Cyber <laughs> Critical Infrastructure Security Agency, uh, actually uh, just today announced that they're publishing a self-assessment tool, uh, which we help them design. So an organization could take a look at their program from a self-assessment perspective without having to worry about sharing those results any further than the way that they wanted. Uh, so there, there are multiple different ways of handling this type of thing. If I had like a more specific concern or a more specific issue, I'd be happy to, to go into greater depth. Okay, well, thank you very much, Michael. So at this point, we are coming to the conclusion of our hour panel session. I do wanna take the opportunity to thank our panelists, starting with Bill Claycomb. Thank you very much, Carrie, Andy, Luke, and Michael. Uh, we appreciate your thoughts, your ideas, your comments. Uh, we appreciate the audience participation through the questions that were submitted. My hope is that you're able to follow up with any of the researchers here, and you can certainly find a lot of the information that was referenced in this, as well as other sessions as part of this on the SEI Software Engineering Institute's website. And with that, thank you to our panelists. Thank you for the great questions by the audience. Dan, turn it back over to you for closing remarks. Thanks very much, Randy. This concludes our 2021 Cert Insider Risk Management Symposium. We'll be following up by sending out PDFs of all of the presentation materials that we've used over the last couple of days to all of the conference registrants. I'd like to thank a few folks as we wrap things up here. Special thanks to our sponsors, Code42, Sideris, and Forcepoint. I'd like to thank all of our panelists and presenters, Bill, Michael, Andy, Carrie, Luke, and all of our uh, presenters from our day one activities as well. I'd also like to acknowledge and really thank the SEI event planning team for all the hard work that went into making this event a success, as well as the SEI's broadcast media team who makes it as easy as possible on our panelists and our presenters. Uh, uh, last but certainly not least, I'd like to thank you all for watching. Please stay engaged with us through our website, sei.cmu.edu. Be on the lookout for the seventh edition of the CERT Common Sense Guide to Managing Insider Risk, and hope to see you back in 2022 for the ninth annual CERT Insider Risk Management Symposium.